Welcome to the Shipping Podcast, where you meet interesting maritime professionals sharing their passion for the shipping industry and their everyday job. I am your host. My name is Lena Gottberg. Hello and welcome back to the Shipping Podcast. In this episode, we are going to meet a man from Cyprus. Who is better to speak about the necessity of shipping and maritime than someone from Cyprus? It's Andreas Christostomo, the director of the Department of Merchant Shipping on Cyprus. I met Andreas at the Mona Lisa II conference in Gothenburg in November 2015. Andreas was nominated by the government of Cyprus for the position of Secretary General at IMO, and I was a bit curious about what makes someone stand up and say, I want to be the Secretary General? And then, when he was not elected, I also asked, how does it feel now? It wasn't that Andreas was new to IMO. In 1999, he became the chairman of the Design and Equipment Subcommittee, and then he moved on to be the chairman of the Marine Environment Protection Committee, known as MEPC, where he stayed on as chairman until 2013. Andreas is rather open about his view about shipping and maritime. And you can hear his passion for the industry in his voice when he speaks about the things to come. This is Andreas Christostomo for you. My name is Andreas Christostomo. I'm a naval architect and I work for the Cyprus government. And now I'm the director of the Maritime Authority since October the 1st. I have a long standing history in shipping for 20 something years. And here I am with you, Lena. Oh, <laughs> yeah, we are in Gothenburg today. So, from a naval architect to where you are now, what have you been doing? What kinds of positions have you had? I started my career working as a trainee naval architect with the British shipbuilders. Unfortunately, they closed down. Okay. Then I returned home in Cyprus. I was in the UK and I started working as a naval architect consultant with a big consultancy firm. In 1993, I joined the Department of Mission Shipping which as a junior surveyor, I grew up through the ranks and today I'm the director. I was also for 10 years the permanent representative of Cyprus to the International Maritime Organization. I served as uh, president of the Institute of Marine Engineering Science and Technology. I did some work with IMO, like I was chairman of the MEPC for 10 years. So that's, that's me. <laughs> so you know a lot about shipping, I can hear that. So what is your responsibility today in, in Cyprus? What does it mean to be the director? Right, the authority is responsible for, the, uh, for some parts of the coastal state, like the surveillance of ships crossing over, the short sea shipping, which is not existing in cargo, but is passenger short sea shipping in general about tourist cruises and stuff like that. Recreational captain, so we are responsible for all that. We are also the flag state administration, which means we take care of the ships registered with Cyprus. We have 1,000 seagoing ships, and we are the 10th largest fleet in the world, so and the third largest in the European Union. Also, we are responsible for the taxation of shipping when people decide to get under the tonnage tax, and that's about not only about Cyprus ships, but uh, the cluster as well from operating from Cyprus. We have a huge third-party ship management center back home, and we have owners that they flag other flags, but they can they are qualified to be in the tonnage tax system. And also we have charters. And of course, we also take care of the poor state responsibilities for ships entering our ports from the point of view of checking that they don't compromise on safety, security, or anything else. But we are not responsible for ports. So, so there is another organization. There is another organization called the Cyprus Port Authority, which is semi-governmental at the moment. It will be, of course, will be commercialized very soon next year. But that's outside my remit. Oh, we have a close cooperation, but we don't do ports. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean it's probably very important to separate mm-hmm. what you are doing and what they are doing. But of course, you need to do that in cooperation. So we are attending the Mona Lisa 2 conference today. How much have you been involved in the Mona Lisa 2 project? To be honest, I am not involved in the Mona Lisa 2 project as such, apart from being a fervent supporter, in the sense that uh, the Port Authority is, the gov- let's say, the government body involved in Mona Lisa 2 or Mona Lisa in general. Uh, although because of my knowledge of what Mona Lisa was all about, I was involved with the initial ideas of e-navigation in IMO, whether we let it go in IMO or not. I was one of those things, 
we all fear of new things to come, but we like them or not, they will take over in a way. So I was always supporting things of the E type. I'll give you a good example. Years and years and years ago, it was probably 97, 98, when actually the, w, the, the World Wide Web was nothing that people knew. There was a registry opening ship registration on the web. And of course, on that time, there was no security. Whatever. And we said, oh, that's bad. And I said, bad or no bad, by 2005, it would be reality. I was wrong. It became 2006, but it's true. So e-navigation is here. We need to take advantage of it. As I said to my keynote speech this morning, as a maritime administrator with a small island, huge responsibilities, and you need to have some help. And that help comes with electronic means. It comes with a uh, new technology we should take care of. It. And I think Mona Lisa, it proves that that thing works. Now, of course, there will be worries about A and B and C. I'm not going to mention them because there's no point of mentioning them. But this is why we have discussions. We do projects, we take data, we analyze, we say, what about this? Can we correct it? There are some discussions about, oh, we're going to eliminate the human interaction. I don't think that's what the navigation is all about. It's not about navigation itself. It's about everything that navigation gets involved. And I tell you that as a flag state implementator, I would like to know where my ships are and everybody's okay, and especially my crew is safe and secure in the middle of the oceans. So I think that's, that's what I can say about Mona Lisa in general. I'm very glad that eventually we have the results. So now we can either collectively or individually, the results will be presented to different people and try to see how we can reap the benefits out of them. And it's an EU-funded project. That's correct, which again shows that the EU is one step ahead of many other institutions, such as I call it institution in this case. And I think... Yeah, if, if, if there was no EU funding, maybe it would, it would have taken a few more years for Mona Lisa to come out from individual funds. We need the business case. Sometimes business case is not apparent. I would I'll put it a different way. Michael Porter used to say in the, in the, in the early 90s, stick to the knitting, don't diversify, for example. And if everything goes okay, why should I diversify? But then you have the research products. So research, research projects are coming with funding, either internally or externally. In Europe, I don't think we have too much money internally. So coming from the EU funding, I think that was a, a great idea. Mm. And I hope so that it will continue because there are things to, to see coming out of it. But of course, you have to get what Mona Lisa gave us now to analyze them and see what we got is good so we can continue further. And I have to tell you, EU projects and sometimes are not very well known, but there are many of them, and most of them, are, I wouldn't say all of them because I don't know all of them myself, but the ones I came across, they, they have a very big benefit if we utilize them afterwards. Yes, I agree. So yesterday someone asked me if there is a web page for all maritime EU projects, so you know where to find them, because if you know about them, they're good, but if you don't know, they right. are there. The thing is, they might not be a consolidated, Page because some, let's say, some EU projects comes from one program, let's say, life, and the other from something else or whatever. So each one has their own uh, one, their own page, and not all of the projects are maritime. But I guess if you know how to use search engines correct, you will consolidate them yourself. Usually, if you say EU shipping projects funded, you get some maritime, you get some others. Might not get all of them, but when you start getting one, I'm sure there is links to the other ones. Now. Personally, I know about at least of 10, 15 that they finish in the last two years. So there are quite a lot. Yeah, I, I get the feeling that EU is actually uh, looking upon the maritime industry as very important for the future development. In my opinion, it's not important. It's essential. That's why European Union also introduced the, um, the motorways of the sea, short sea shipping, which is very difficult to say with three S's. It's important and it's essential. Uh, can you imagine Cyprus without shipping? It's the same with Iceland, for example. Okay, it's not the EU, but it's the EA. We need to import stuff. 
uh, we need to it's have raw materials. It's the same with Sweden, actually. We've got the longest coastline in the EU. EU, that's correct. But we have a problem that our politicians doesn't realize. But at least in your case, you can utilize road transport. We can't. Yeah, we have no one way. bridge to One bridge connected to the EU. <laughs> <laughs> that's correct, exactly. Yeah, we've got one bridge to Norway as well, but yeah. that's not that's, EU. That's not EU. For us, uh, it's important, no, but, but not only important yeah, for us, but it's also important for the well-being of the nation because shipping provides so many... Okay, in Cyprus we might not use, use shipping to go from A to B because of the geographical structure of Cyprus. Fine. But in other islands or in Sweden, you have short connections with ferries and so on. Can you imagine that all that was going on land with uh, only by land transport? We already have congestion. Yeah. <laughs> imagine that yeah. you wouldn't have that way out. So... It is essential, and it's here, and it will not go away. So we better deal with it to get it safer, more efficient, and more effective. So okay. I also know that you put yourself out as a candidate for the IMO Secretary General. How and I was lost. That? Yeah, you lost. <laughs> yeah, we're sorry about that. How was that to become a candidate? Oh, I think my government saw that I can do the job. It shows that we have supporters. Of course, it's a political decision. Cyprus, compared to the other five candidates, was the smallest country competing. We came third. We are very happy about that. But, of course, that's to consolidation that you lost because I lost. It was a great experience uh, because at least I have to elaborate on how I see my dream of governing a body of like that and how IMO can become the global regulator, not substituting uh, national regulators, not substituting regional regulators, but actually setting a global theme for shipping. So ships go from A to B and from Swedish ports to Cypriot ports or whatever, they don't have to change standards. Can you imagine that every time we enter a new port, we have to reconstruct the ship? That would be impossible. And on the other hand, the shipping is so global, most probably the most globalized industry in the world. It needs a global regulator. And it needs a regulator without other but I feel in getting involved, like even climate change, IMO has to solve the problem. We don't need external influences. And also, I believe that in IMO, we can hear the seafarers and we can hear the ship owners and we can hear somehow the cargo interest as well, which is very important. So I tried to do that. I passed my word. And on the other hand, I made more friends than I had before. So yes, it was an extremely good, nice experience. But what was the, the best thing that you knew about the friendships, but... But uh, what was the single most important thing that you personally learned from that experience? There are many interests around the world, about, around shipping. I mean, everybody looks about having common goals, safety, security, and environmental protection. But there are different interests. Some states are more into facilitating ports, others facilitating flag services, others facilitating cargo services. That's why my theme, and I think... It was very well uh, appreciated by the others, and I also gained back a, a satisfaction that was received more. Is what I wish to call it all to work together to be a united community. And I think that was everybody accepted that thing. I used to call it togetherness, and uh, it sounds a little bit too personal, but at the end of the day, since we're such a globalized industry, something more personal is required to keep the whole thing together. And, and the best satisfaction I had is that everybody appreciated what I was trying to say. It was relevant and on the point. Now, why we got, didn't get elected? As I said, decisions are political and politics are totally different. Yeah, but at least you put yourself out there. So, oh. But you would encourage other people to stand oh, yes. up for that. Yes, to, to say, stand up, of course. It doesn't matter where you're coming from. It doesn't matter how small or big your country is, as long as your country is willing to put your name forward and you are willing to take the burden. It's not an easy job. Then do it. You should not stop. I'm sorry. This is what this whole life is about. Either you, you have a career if you want, or you have a, a dynamic career or a stagnant career. It's up to you. Personally, I cannot sit on the same chair for long. <laughs> Do you think there will be a female candidate next time? I hope time? so. Uh, we already had one years ago from Nigeria. She came second from the three. Yeah, why not? It was Mrs. Ponefo. She was director legal at the time, or director coffee. She was one of the five directors of IMO. Uh, she lost to Mr. Metropolis. 
So we had the female candidate the first and last time. I hope so in the future that we see more. Why not? There is not, no difference there because the qualifications doesn't have to be a seafarer. There are, there are not too many seafarer women, let's say, but they can be lawyers, they can be economists, they can be business women. And I'm sure in the future we might see someone from the outside. I mean, outside even shipping, just uh, possibly a very good administrator or a very good manager, a very good CEO approaching to do the job. Yeah. I know you are a friend of the Vista ladies. Mm-hmm. So you have seen the ones I have seen probably within, within that group that could maybe be a candidate. But uh, we have to persuade them. <laughs> yeah, because some of them might not want to move to London. No. Because London, for some people, is nice. For some people, might not be nice. You never yeah. know. You've been around for a while. How do you see the future for shipping in general? I don't tend to focus for shipping because... Shipping, it comes in economic terms, it comes in technical terms and so on. What I see from the technical side is that the environmental concerns that will become more pressing, uh, especially climate change issues, will be more pressing in the near future. Economic-wise, I'm not the best person to ask the questions on that, but I see the freight rates still on the low side, and I hope so that they go up. But the future for shipping in general is bright because technology will shape how we see ships today. As a naval architect, I've already seen changes on the design process, on the construction process, and I am very happy ships became safer and more environmentally friendly. So the future is bright. And for the job we're doing, I think we are still unchallengeable. Nobody can do the job as safe and secure and cheap as we can. So... It will become expensive, that's a nice story. <laughs> yeah, because I think we have a technical leap ahead of us of to become the green <clears throat> transport mode compared to other transport modes. And as I understand it, the problem right now is to get the finance to do that. Because, I mean, the world economy is in really bad shape. And it's not only Europe, it's not only Eurozone, it's all over the world we see that. Shipping freight rates are extremely low. Some markets have recovered a little bit. The, as far as I understand, the dry market is quite low still. What are we going to do? We can become more green, but you need to invest. And the investment, it doesn't look, it comes easy at the moment. But I am hopeful yeah. if the recession, if they would change the recession around, the more funding will be on. The good thing about the slowdown of the world economy, it brought slowdown of speed as well, which of course, contributes to to less CO2. That's one green side, at least. But for example, we need to invest on balanced water management systems. We want to invest on scrappers. There are ships that they might not be able to afford. Yeah, and that's a problem. But when the money are around, shipping always wills to become... And it is a green industry in many ways. I think uh, it's also an innovative... And, and innovative. Technical, technical forward industry in a way that people uh, do not know. Exactly. And saying something here, uh, many people say, oh, you're too slow. And I say, no, we're not too slow. You have in mind other modes of transport, where you see the sister design. That is Airbus 313, there are, I don't know how many pieces. There is the bus, whatever, so many of those. You, there is this uh, other kind of uh, on-land transport train, and there's so many. When it comes to ship, everyone is individual. Yes, they are open carriers, they are all tankers, but each one is individual. And every one of them has its own innovation, either specific innovation, innovation that will become a generation's innovation. But in my opinion, we are miles ahead of innovation than other industries. But you cannot see the, no, I will not use the word average person, the person on the street cannot see that. A ship and a ship is the same, but internally and not the same. And this is something we have to give credit to the industry. And the ship is a much more complex structure than any other thing that goes around. People just say, yeah, most probably the spacecrafts are more complex, but a ship is a very complex structure, and it's, it's a structure that is not easy to monitor 100% every second, but at least we monitor it every minute. So it's it's well done and, and well ahead of its time, but it cannot be seen just like that. Speaking about the general public, uh, we are looked upon as the invisible industry because people in general do not see ships anymore because of uh, all the regulations with ISPS and so on. How do you think we should become more visible? How can we do that? All right. 
I always answer this question with another question. Is it necessary to become visible? What would be the benefit? I think if we put down the pawns and cons of invisibility, the pawns and cons of visibility, we, we will be indifferent. What we not to be seeing is some of the heights behind the scenes. No, we are invisible because we're doing a, a safe transportation without the need of big fiestas. On the other hand, we carry cargos. So, not too many people are interested about cargos, but they might be more interested about buses and aeroplanes because actually they carry persons as such as passengers. So I think the outreach that we have up the, the 2000 and onwards, it's, it's been much more than what, the visibility we have after 2000 with the one before is much bigger. Do we need to go beyond that? Then again, we have to stop and reflect on ourselves and see what's the benefits we're going to get and what are the advantages and disadvantages. I think what the public wants is for us to be transparent. And I think from 2010 and onwards, I think shipping is as transparent as any other industry, so I don't see any other reason. Now, we need to be more transparent and visible when it comes to convince people to become seafarers. This is where we have a problem, but that is not about shipping. It's about how we sell the profession. I think we missed out the point that shipping a career on board a ship nowadays, it's most probably better than a career on shore or it's a career which has prospects. How do we put the message out? That's why we need visibility. That's why I said if we put down and hierarchically put down which parts we need visibility, nowadays the number one is how we convince youngsters to become seafarers or officers or whatever on board the ship. I'm a very fanatical about that, but yes, there are there is a bigger competition now with onshore jobs, but the recession might help us. On that way. So this, uh, what it was, I had an expression in the United States, in New York last week, don't let a, a, bad rece- a big recession go wasted and use it to get something out of it. So turn, turn a challenge into an opportunity. That's, uh, yeah, but also, I mean, if we are talking about uh, these uh, unmanned ships, that is now a big topic. But, uh, maybe, I would turn that around. Have you ever seen an unmanned plane? No, but we we know that there are. But we we've seen automatic pilots, right, going around for years. Yeah, technology might need less human hands on board, but then you might see more ships going around. So again, you might have the same number. No, but to to the point, I think that maybe we need to change the education a bit. Oh, possibly, if you're yeah. sitting on land, being a maritime operator instead of being a mariner oh. on board. Yeah, it's still a ship, it will be still a shipping profession. Uh, whether you do the driver, uh, sorry, the navigator from land on a joystick, let's say, or do it on, on the board itself, that's no difference for the job. The thing is, we should not see technology as being replacing the human, because at the end of the day, the human will make the decisions. Now, when we come to that age that the machines make the decisions on our behalf, that's another story. Let's emigrate to another planet, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> So who would you be curious to listen to the shipping podcast? Who do you think I should interview? Andreas Nordsted, I love that guy, from Denmark. The outgoing SG, try that one, and Mr. Metropolis, he's, he's very good on these things. If you, you want to get hold of him, he's in London, I can arrange for that. But from the shipping operation side, I suggest it would be nice, Lena, to talk to some also operators from the south, Spain, Italy, Greece. There's a different shipping model there. Because I work with both North and South and I can see the difference. Each one of them has its benefits and it depends on the routes. So for the benefit of all your listeners, it's good to have a wider spread of views and ideas. And of course, I'm sure you spoke to the Canadians and you know about the ECAs and all that kind of things. But it would be nice if you do one or two podcasts about shipping operations in different parts of Europe. Because yeah. they're not the same model. I'm working on that. Uh, I only need my sponsors to get me the traveling tickets, I know. traveling <laughs> costs, and then I will do that. Okay. I know a lot of people also in the southern Europe, which uh, will be interesting to talk to. I love these uh, philosophical uh, discussions that we have on shipping, because you never get them otherwise. No, we need to have them eventually, yes, and we, we don't do. have our think tanks doing it on no, our behalf. No, so that's no. it. 
Thank you very much, Andreas, for taking the time. My and pleasure. Have a safe journey back. Thank you, Andreas. That was very kind of you to share your views on all these different things happening in the industry at the moment. I hope that many of you will share Andreas's episode for more people to listen to. There are so many things happening at the moment. I can really feel that the shipping podcast is taking off into the next level. I have booked some really, really good guests at the Connecticut Maritime Association Conference, 21st to 23rd of March. You will be meeting some really interesting people. You have still not listened to the fabulous interviews I made in London, but they are coming up for you. During this spring, you will be amazed, I promise you. Another thing I realize, once I have interviewed the guests on the shipping podcast, they realize that this is a powerful tool, a tool which we can use to actually raise the profile of shipping. I realize that since I put it out on iTunes, anyone can download it. I am not only speaking to the people who already has got the shipping bug, I'm speaking to anyone now. And that has made a difference for me. I get approached by people who doesn't know things about shipping. I get approached by people who are from another industry but is interested in what we are doing. I'm approached by young people who thinks this is a great way of understanding and knowing more things. So I hope you will continue to help me spread the word about shipping. There is a Twitter account where the handle is Shipping Podcast. There is an Instagram account where you can also follow a little bit about the details surrounding the interviews and the episodes. And now I'm thinking about a newsletter. What would you like to read in a newsletter? Or do you hate newsletters and you don't want any more? And those are the things that I'm struggling with when I'm packing my suitcase to go to the CMA 2016 with the theme Local Talent, Global Impact. I think it's just made for the shipping podcast. So until the next time, Think about how you could actually help raising the profile of shipping in your own way, in your own channels, with people that doesn't know what you know about shipping. You could also become a hero. Thank you for listening to The Shipping Podcast. Don't forget to tell everyone that you meet that there is a shipping podcast where the maritime professionals are talking about their everyday jobs.